Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for uh, joining us for this discussion of um, Griffith Review Enduring Legacies, which um, has been a really terrific volume um, of this publication. Um, it's our 48th, um, and in this case, I had the great pleasure of, uh, of working with uh, Dr. Peter Cochran as, as a co-editor. Um, Peter's um, not able to be here tonight, but was was a wonderful person to work with. I mean, he's a very eminent historian and, and brought a great depth of knowledge to to um, to this the discussion of war and its legacies. <coughs> One of the um, the themes, I guess, that we we decided to take with this particular edition was not to. We were very conscious as we were planning it over the previous couple of years that that this would be a year when there'd be a great deal of attention being paid to the commemoration of Anzac, quite rightly. Um, and we were sort of anticipating that there'd be a lot of recreations of battles and a lot of material about, you know, the horrors of the trenches and, and so on. And so we were very determined that what we would do was something that was different to that. And we were hoping that we could assume that that was going to be going on and that we would be able to have the space to do something that was a little bit different. And as we started working that up, we realised that, of course, as well as being the centenary of Gallipoli this year, being a five-year, it coincides with a whole lot of anniversaries. So the 70th anniversary at the end of the Second World War, um, the anniversary at the end of the Vietnam War, and so on. So there was a whole lot of stuff that was that was um, able available in a way for us to think about the legacies of of war. So today, um, I'm really pleased that we're at, we've got a very distinguished panel who've written wonderful pieces for this, uh, for this volume. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the invisible stories, some of, some of the sort of hidden layers of, of, what, uh, of how modern societies or this modern society has in, in a way got framed by and developed by the experience of war, not necessarily what happened on the battlefield, but what happened at home and elsewhere. So let me introduce um, our, our three uh, participants. On my uh, far left, I've got a left-right problem, on my far left is David Carlin. Um, David's been a regular writer for Griffiths Review over quite a number of years now and is the author of the wonderfully, wonderfully titled and greatly successful and, and marvellous book, The Abyssinian Contortionist, um, which has been released to great acclaim in, in the last little while. Um, and which sort of, in a way, started life with a piece that, that you wrote for us a long time ago. That's right. Yeah. Um, so we like, to, we like to claim a little bit. Um, and his earlier book, um, Our Father Who Wasn't There, which we'll probably discuss a little bit during the conversation today. Um, David's also a director, researcher and teacher and co-directs the Non-Fiction Lab as an associate professor at RMIT University. Please welcome David. Um, the next is uh, Joy Demusi. Uh, Joy is an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow and Professor of History at the University of Melbourne. Her book, Memory and Migration in the Shadow of War, Australia's Greek Immigrants After World War II and the Greek Civil War will be, will be published by Cambridge University Press this year. And the essay that Joy's written for this edition gives a little taste of uh, some of what's uh, covered in that 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 book. Joy's really been an enormously influential scholar in actually making this sort of emotional cost and the sort of human consequences of these sort of big, big events in 20th century life available. So we're very delighted that, uh, that she's been able to both write for the volume and be here tonight. Please welcome Joy. And, uh, and finally, Janine Baker. Uh, Janine is a historian and documentary maker and a postdoctoral research fellow at uh, Macquarie University. Um, she's had a long history in television and radio uh, journalism, um, but last year completed her PhD um, at the University of Melbourne on women war reporters. And I came across it because I had the great privilege of, of being one of her assessors, which I think you're allowed to say after the event, if not <laughs> at the time. And it was, I thought it was a marvellous piece of work. And um, um, it, it went on to win the, uh, the prize at Melbourne University last year for the best Australian history uh, thesis, uh, which is a real achievement. And the book that's come as a result of that thesis, Australian War Reporters, will be published by New South Press later this year, I think in September. Um, and Janine has given a little taste of that work in her essay for this uh, edition. So please welcome Janine. Thank you. 
So what I'd like to sort of start with is, is a bit about the sort of the hidden legacies and the, the silences and the areas of discussion about the sort of emotional costs, both of war as it happens and then as it endures in families and in communities over a long period of time. Joy, this has been your area of study for a long time. I mean, tell us a bit about... Thanks, about Julianne. Yeah, so um, I suppose I started in this field um, in the 90s when I wrote uh, my book called The Labour of Loss, which looked at uh, widows, mothers and fathers who lost sons and husbands during World War I and World War II. And I was particularly interested in the emotional impact of war within the family, um, both uh, at, a, at a domesticated level, if you like, and then at a sort of state level, exploring how uh, grief and trauma was uh, integrated or not in um, remembrance of war. Um, I guess my particular interest in that project was around uh, mothers. I didn't feel at that time that mothers who had lost sons and many sons, in, in the case of some families, um, had really uh, got the attention that they deserve from historians. So I was particularly interested in looking at how they coped or not, um, and, he, and women who were very patriotic, I'm not talking about women necessarily who were anti-war, um, but even so losing sons, um, as I say, in the case of many, you know, many sons. Um, created a sort of residue of grief in the family. So I've sort of looked at that in that mm. context. And that's been a sort of theme I've been interested in for some time. And so this current project that you've described, Julianne, and, and from where this, this particular piece um, comes from, sort of continues that theme in a, in a different setting. And, and that mm. setting is post-1945 Australia, looking at migrants in particular, and more specifically, the Greek community, which is the community I'm from, um, and growing up myself, um, listening to stories of war um, and how uh, they have uh, endured in the family and why it's been, I think, important for groups often who migrated at that time to keep memory alive of those wartime experiences. And then I go on to reflect also on how that's an intergenerational issue. So it's not only those who endured uh, war firsthand, but also the children of those who did. Mm -hmm. And the choices that are made about what is told to children about war mm -hmm. as they're growing up in a new society. Mm. OK. Well, we'll come back to some of the particularities yeah. of, of mm. that immigrant experience mm. and, and the sort of visibility and the invisibility mm. of that. But let me just now introduce David and your family story in this regard. It sort of picks up from that quite nicely, doesn't it? I mean, it's uh, yeah, it does. Um, my, so my story that's that's in this edition of the Griffith Review is called the Bronzista of Muradup, and so I wanted, in, in the name of it, to kind of capture the the strangeness of this juxtaposition and and the the story behind it of this this friendship that we've had in our family for seventy years now with a family in Venice, um, and. So it's a very, I think it's a, it's a very small story. You know, it's, it's just a, a, a snapshot from one particular family that um, was on a farm in Western Australia during World War II, my grandfather's farm. Um, and uh, in 1944, um, there, was a, there, there was a whole lot of Italian prisoners of war who were resettled to Australia as um, farm labourers. And, and two of them came to my grandfather's farm and one of them in particular um, learned English very quickly and he was a bronze smith from Venice. And he'd been, he'd been captured in North Africa two years previously and he'd spent all of this time being sent, being sort of displaced across the world. He was in North Africa for a while, then he was sent to India for a long time. So he was sitting in the middle of nowhere in India wondering whether this would ever end and then finally he was sent to Australia. And as soon as he arrived at my grandfather's farm, he he was. They they formed a bond, and of, of friendship. Even though that one was supposed to be the the prisoner of war, one was supposed to be the, you know, the boss. And this this bond um, then endured. And his he was so grateful for the way that he was treated with respect, and that, that he was he was treated as a as a cultured European man. Uh, and his family has has never stopped repaying that debt in a way. Um, so after the war, my grandparents went to Venice a couple of times and they visited Joe there. He had a daughter who's the same age as, as my older sister. 
They maintained the friendship. I went there when I was 10, and then I took my own kids back there and when he was 95, and we sat in his, his, um, around his table in, in Venice. They live right near, near the Rialto Bridge, which is sort of just as far away from Murrid up as you could possibly imagine. <laughs> and, and his grandson had made a project in Italian all about his grandfather's prisoner of war experiences and he'd found his diaries and he'd, re, he'd, he'd reconstructed it through talking to him. Um, and, uh, and then finally last year after Joe, who's the, the um, Italian man, had died, his, his daughter was released in a sense from looking after him and she was able to come to Australia and visit the farm which, which she'd know, you know, he'd told her about all his life. And, um, and it was, it was just amazing how, sort of, how strong this emotional bond is now, has become across four generations of our family and three mm. generations of their family. And it's just sort of based on this sort of very small act of kindness to begin with. Um, and when she, when she was there on the farm, I said to her, how was it, how did you feel? And she said, she talked, she, she just imagined him, she was talking to him and he was saying, what's, what's it like there, has it changed? And, so it was. It was. Uh, so it's a very um, sort of small and gentle story mm. of war, as against a kind of you know mm. often their stories of kind of intergenerational trauma and things like that. And this is a kind of counter story in some way. Yeah, a good news story. We like that. Yeah, <laughs> a positive side. But what's interesting about both of them is 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 that is this sort of emotional you know the emotional both. Um, I was going to say toll, but that's not really right. But the, the sort of the extent of the emotional engagement that, mm. that is there. Now, Janine, in your piece, which is about women war reporters, you write very interestingly, and I'll get you to explain what you've done. But but you write very interestingly about the the inhibition that attached to female war reporters in writing about emotion and the emotional dimension of war, um, mm. and that that was a real constraint. But maybe you can use that to frame your your description. Okay, yeah, sure. So my essay and also my broader research is about um, women who reported war, Australian women. And one of the things I wanted to do was question the notion that women weren't proper war reporters. So historians have tended to minimise uh, the reporting of women, arguing that they just did women's stuff, just did domestic kind of angle reporting, um, that they were solely on the war, on the home front, that they never went anywhere near the um, battlefield, um, and that it was brief, and so we shouldn't sort of worry about them too much. And I questioned all of those things. I found that actually women didn't just do women's angle um, reporting, that actually they did do some, quite a few of them were what we would call general reporters. Um, also, I wanted to question, well, if it, does it is women's angle reporting not war reporting? So women's angle meant, and that time meant, looking at the impact of war on civilians. And these days, of course, this is what how war reporting is done. We find out about refugees and um, children and dealing with um, injuries and death. You know, that's all part of war reporting. So if that's what we consider war reporting now, then why can't we include? Um, the women who covered World War II, who did similar stories about refugees and the work of medical staff and so on. Why don't we consider them war reporters? Um, one of the big reasons that it was argued that women couldn't pro be war reporters was that they were too emotional. So not only did, was it felt they just didn't belong on the battlefield, that they had no affinity with the battlefield, but that they were too emotionally engaged but at the same time they were forced into this kind of emotional type of reporting um, because that was the way journalism believed that women should write. So they were in a bind there. Um, and one of the stories that I told was about a particular war reporter called Lorraine Stum, who was a Brisbane, from Brisbane, and she reported... Um, she went to Hiroshima just six weeks after the bomb had dropped and she was flown over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and she was completely unprepared for what she would witness there. And she had to hold in how she felt, even though, like all the other journalists, she felt very pleased that 
the Allies had won. She was quite, um, you know, extremely sort of critical about the Japanese. She spoke about them very harshly. She she characterised them as being wily and sly and all those types of things that were very common at the time. But when she saw the devastation of Hiroshima, she was completely shocked into silence. But she had to hold in how she felt about it because she couldn't let the men who were in the plane with her and working alongside her know that she had this emotional kind of engagement with what she saw. Um, and then that came back to haunt her um, in her later years and she let out the feelings that she'd kept kind of hemmed in. It's interesting, isn't it? That, so that as she got older, that, that, that she was unable to hold that, mm. that well, that, that material, you know, that, that, the trauma that she'd witnessed. Yeah, she, as I think she had dementia towards the end of her life and so the, the twin um, tragedies of her life, and they were both connected to World War II, one was the death of her husband who was an airman who was killed in India, and what she saw at Hiroshima just... She just kept talking about it. Mm. She would just say the bomb, the bomb, mm. and um, and how she couldn't believe what humans could do to other humans. Mm. Mm. It's one of the things that comes through in all this discussion about about the legacies of war is is that notion of silence. Um, and there's, I mean, it seems to me that there's a sort of funny paradox in a way about now because in the coverage of the commemoration of Anzac, we are we are hearing stories. You know, it's sort of subsided a bit now, but but we are hearing stories every day of acts of heroism and horror, and and valour and and all the rest of it. But detailed sort of tales that people were recreating or finding in diaries and so on. But the the, the comment was always, oh, he never talked about it. She never talked about it when when she came back. And so this is a sort of funny thing that happens, a, you know, a century on, where stuff that couldn't be talked about mm -hmm. at the time is now being talked about you know, in enormous detail. Mm. That's something, I think, Joy, in, in th that your, your communities, in a way, have dealt with in sort of different ways, haven't well, they? Well, indeed, Julianne. I mean, I guess, I guess when you look at communities that leave a war-torn site, um, like Europe after the Second World War, and migrate, um, there has to be a decision made. How do you negotiate that past? How do you integrate it into your future? Mm. How do you talk about it to your... Um, children or relatives. And what I found when I interviewed families and children of those who'd been directly involved in um, pretty atrocity, uh, you know, pretty brutal atrocities in World War II mm -hmm. and, and the Greek Civil War, which happened in the 1940s, you had two polarised approaches. One was um, never to stop talking about it mm -hmm. and feel that it was part of the legacy of um, the migration process, that you had to preserve the memory of those in the past in, in Europe. Um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, absolute silence, that mm. we are here to begin a new life, we are forging forward in order to do that, uh, it's best forgotten. And it seemed to me that those two extremes were being played out in families, um, and uh, it was very interesting to me how um, the selective memory of silence, I guess, um, mm. that uh, there weren't details given to children, made exactly what you're saying, Julianne, made people want to know more. Mm. Mm. And so you had people undertaking family histories, going back to Greece, wanting to know, you know, undertaking um, oral histories mm. back, at, back in Greece. Mm. So, I don't know, silence ironically produces the desire to know more mm. Um, mm. rather than to accept and repress, if yes. you like. Mm. I mean, the other thing is um, the question of assimilation. Mm. And, of course, Australia in the 1950s, very much driven by assimilation um, policy uh, and uh, it's very interesting how at that time that climate wasn't one to talk about the mm. legacy of war it was one to assimilate and move on uh, and the pressure to do that was quite extreme I think mm. um, so I've raised questions about that about the way in which um, I guess government policy encouraged uh, or didn't at least engage with these traumas that many, as we know, in Melbourne here, particularly mm. the highest Holocaust mm. survivor population mm. in the world, mm. Mm. Um, at that time didn't really uh, engage with and expected many of the migrant communities uh, to just uh, integrate, as it were, mm. in a seamless thread. So I guess mid-20th century, there was less of an uh, interest in engaging with questions of grief and trauma. Mm. I think in the early 21st century, what we're finding is a, um, a public space mm. 
where that is now much more acceptable and discussion of it more acceptable, I think, on so many levels. Mm, mm. Um, but certainly those two polar opposites of silence versus, um, you know, full engagement uh, was, has been played out in those communities. Mm. I guess it's what happens to memory of war when it leaves the home site, as mm. it were. Is it forgotten? Is that family history gone? Or is it preserved? And if it is preserved, in what form? Mm. And it's a particular issue, I think, for you know, for a country like Australia, which has been so dependent on such large numbers of migration, mm. people migrating over such a long period of time, mm. that how, as a state or as a society, we find ways of incorporating those stories. Mm. Um, one of the things, one of the pieces, in the, there's a number in the book, but mm. but one of the pieces that 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 I think strikes a note in that regard is a piece by Gerhard Fischer mm. about the sort of process of German, German. internment. Yeah. And then Definitely. that extraordinary story of, you know, six mm. or 7,000 mm. German Australians mm. being deported at the end of the war. I mean, people who had been born here were being deported. Phenomenal. Yeah. And, I mean, mm. that's something which is just, I mean, it's a, a bit of the story mm. that nobody knows, you know. Mm. And it's so it's something mm. that, that is so central can mm. just get written out. Absolutely. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's an ugly part of Australian history that mm. that would happen. Mm. But mind you, in the context of World War One, World War Two, and World War One actually, mm. Um, you know, we can see how that would happen. Mm, absolutely. Um, and that war generates that sort of hate yeah. and, and, and racist hatred, yeah. which is the, all the reasons we shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't happen. But yeah, yeah. Um, that was the first casualty, that sort of racial component to war yes, yeah. is very pronounced. Yes. Mm. Which made your, your grandfather's behaviour, David, sort of, you know, I mean, he was obviously a very decent man and, and his personal engagement was very... Was, was very strong with Joe and the, and the other guy who was who was stationed, you know, attached to him, but but the legacy of silence plays out in other ways in your family as well. Yes, exactly. That, I, I mean, that that was very much a, as you said, like a good news story. That was something that was happily told in our family. Um, my, by my first book, which was called Our Father Who Wasn't There, was an, was another kind of war story. And exactly what what you were saying before, Joy, um, it was a silence in our family. My father died when I was six months old and was never spoken about again. And this silence just made me, as, a, as an adult and as a storyteller, you know, this was the story that I was going to tell if, you know, if it killed them sort of thing. Yeah. And, um, uh, <clears throat> and as I, and, and the book is a, is a detective story really to find out what had happened to him. It turned out that he'd committed suicide, so that explained the taboo. But then I uncovered these 17 years of of um, medical records through the, through rehabilitation because uh, he was all that we knew when he died was that it was something to do with the war, and so as a child, you know, you were you were just left with this this mm. wondering, and and the silence was all around protecting our mother, mm. and on the other hand, our mother wanted to protect us, you know, because mm. she she thought if she didn't tell us, then she'd be able to take the burden herself. But the interesting thing about when I found out more and more about my father's story, it was it was really a a story about the history of psychiatry mm. in, in Australia in the 40s, 50s and 60s, as well as social mores mm. around, um, you know, in Western Australia where I grew up at that time in the 60s, apparently women didn't go to funerals in, in, the, in this culture um, because they would, you know, they would uh, show too much obvious grief and then the men would get upset too and then, you know... Who knows where it would be? Goodness <laughs> knows what would happen. Um, and, but it turned out that my father actually wanted... He, he, what, the, what, what, what actually had happened to him then was a very different trauma than what I imagined. It wasn't like being, you know, bayoneted and all that sort of thing. It was actually a sexual um, abuse thing. And he wanted to talk about it after the war mm. um, and try and work out... try and sort of work through his, his issues. Mm. You can see this again and again. And the psychiatrists at the time were kind of like saying, you know, just get over it and get back to your life. And so it was fascinating to see how even at that time when someone mm. wanted to resolve, um, mm. you know, these sort of issues, how they were kind of put back into their box. Mm. Um, mm. And I, had a, as I, I met this woman the other day who's a psychotherapist who'd read my book and she said, oh, I just felt that, you know, I felt so emotional at the end because I thought I could have... Mm. I could have him. treated him, mm. you know, but in those days that that treatment wasn't available. Mm. Mm. It's interesting. I mean, that that dwelling on feelings, mm. which uh, which is so pervasive now. I mean, you know, your your father's story in terms of the sort of sexual harassment and uh, sexual abuse and so on. Mm. I mean, you know, we're hearing 
you know, the most hideous details day after day of these royal commissions, of, you know, of the, of the testimony and so on that's been given. And, you know, that, in that case, it's not the journalist saying, how do you feel? I mean, the feeling is, is mm. just swamping everything. Mm. Um, but it's a remarkable turn in a, in a short period. So, Janine, you know, in your, in your world, I mean, this sort of attention on feeling, I mean, you're, I think you quote Elizabeth Riddell saying, you know, that women were made to be invisible after, you know, after be the war. And, and so this perpetual discovery of you're the first, you know, is, is sort of something that is, is sort of like you're on, a, you're on a revolving door and no one can talk about the stuff that's gone before. Being the first is very important to journalists. Mm -hmm. So, and sometimes it went to ridiculous... Uh, degrees, you know, that if somebody was already the first, they would be the first to something else. So if we already had the first journalist in uh, Japan after World War II, they would be the first female journalist in Japan after World War II, or the first one to cover the BCOF or whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> being first was very important, but I think that being the first resulted in a kind of an erasing of the women who came before them and who sometimes stood alongside them because they were so focused on being the first. And so I think women reporters have no sense of there being any sort of um, tradition. Um, and I found women war reporters going back to the Boer War. I found two Australian women who covered the Boer War for quite a long period of time, both of them for well over a year. Um, no one knows about them. I doubt that the women who reported um, Australian women who reported in the 80s and 90s and 2000s knew anything about mm -hmm. the women who came before them in World War II. And that's partly because of these assumptions that they weren't really war reporters, mm. but also because everyone's got to be the first, mm. I think. Mm. Yeah. And what about the sort of silencing? I mean, do you think there's an active sort of silencing that it, that it is part of that as well? I think that's probably part of journalism, mm. that especially with general reporting where there's no... Where, in those days, in World War II, it was very rare to have a byline um, in quality newspapers. So even finding articles by journalists is very difficult, and by women it's doubly difficult mm -hmm. because they were more likely to be denied a byline mm -hmm. than men were. Um, so there's a silencing in that way because if you can't discover them, you mm -hmm. can't sort of bring them to light. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think there's been a silencing in histories because of this mm -hmm. assumption that they weren't uh, worth kind of studying. And then because women's history is very difficult to research, mm -hmm. um, lots and lots of time spent finding tiny little mm -hmm. snippets of information in the archives, mm -hmm. I think probably those assumptions keep getting re repeated without somebody taking the time to mm -hmm. really find mm -hmm. out whether that's true. Mm -hmm. So once you do dig down, you find that they actually they did cover some quite remarkable stories and do some really incredible writing. Mm. But I'm not, I have to say, I'm not arguing that women were as productive or as, I'm not arguing that they were close to the battlefield and that they reported in the same way as men because there's no denying that they were kept on the periphery. Mm. Mm. So, but I wanted to find out why. Why were they kept there and mm. how did, what, uh, what effects did that have on their writing? Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, Joy, that gender dimension is obviously really... I mean, that's been one of the things that you've been most actively engaged with as well, isn't it? Yeah, just pick up on what Jim was saying. I mean, absolutely, women's history is very hard to write because the resources are not as available. But um, I, I guess it brings home um, the point that um, when you do a social history of war, that invites an analysis of women's role. And I think one of the great um, leaps, actually, of, of research in the last... 20 years, 30 years, has been to write women into war history. Um, they were there in so many capacities, as you're suggesting. They were there on the home front, they were there on the battlefront, they were there in uh, many, many sort of layers of society. And, um, and the role that women have played um, as mourners, as activists, as pro-war, anti-war, uh, in the munitions factories, um, in Britain they virtually won the war. Um, in that, in that labour in the munitions mm. factories, um, and so on and so forth. I think um, looking at, at the role of women in war has really been a fantastic advance of social and cultural history. Obviously, you know, not to detract from the story we know about mm. battlefields and so on, but I think it adds the richness of understanding the, the, to the, the impact of total war, which mm. was to um, impact on society at, at every level, 
um, at every uh, sort of unit and um, particularly, especially um, on the home front with women and children and families, mm -hmm. which has historically not been considered. But mm -hmm. the impact, and I guess just coming back to some of the research I've been looking at, the custodians of memory of war are often women. Um, men might come back and forget, and it's often, I mean, you know, um, just on a personal level, it was my mother who continued the, mm. the memory of uh, her experience and her family's experience in the Greek Civil War, and mm. she was very keen, very adamant that we knew the story, mm. and she kept that going. My father had absolutely no interest in doing mm. that. Mm. He was of the school that um, we're here, this is the new society, we move all that behind mm. and leave it. Mm. Um, so I think women have played a very complex role, actually, mm. in this mm. story, um, in both world wars. Mm. Uh, and um, there's still a lot more research to be done, though. It's mm. not a closed story by any means. Mm. And, uh, yes, I think... Um, Gender is really important to me as well in the stories that I've been telling that relate to war. And I suppose, I suppose around different notions of masculinity, really. Um, so I was thinking earlier in, in terms of the, um, the Bronze Easter of Maradup story that it's built around this, this friendship between my grandfather and, and Joe Giuseppe Garizzo of Venice. And I thought to myself, oh, this is a male friendship in war. You know, am I thinking... Is this an example of mateship? And I thought, no, it's not. For me, mateship, that idea is, is a very um, sort of monocultural idea in some ways. And, and this was a, 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 a gentle, sensitive friendship across cultures, uh, which didn't have some of those, what I, I think of as the kind of exclusionary overtones of, of, of mateship can have in the Australian context. Mm -hmm. And of course, in, the, in my book, Our Father Who Wasn't There, that was very much a drama about masculinity mm. and, and my father's grappling with, with kind of how to be a man. And mm. as it turned out, as the story unfolded, a lot of it, a key character was his father, who was a career soldier. His name was Tom, and he was a kind of hyper-masculinist figure who, and my father was the eldest son, and he didn't kind of live up to, mm. to the type of man that he should have been, according to his father. And, and so then going into the, you know, he went to World War II as a 17-year-old and was in this all-male environment on mine, um, minesweepers in the Pacific. And so th that was very much mm. a, a central part of, of the story, was, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of intensified in war, if anything, mm. th these... Um, mm the the um, the isolate you know the sort of the the make the uh, yeah the intensification of kind of atmospheres mm, of, mm, of masculinity mm, mm, and the effects mm. that can have mm. I, I mean living up to that sort of hyper heroism which mm. is never possible in war I think yeah it's and it's also time. living up to the kind of you know the drinking culture or the all the you know it's not necessarily right. being a hero but mm. but being one of the boys That's mm. right. mm. Yeah. And your your women journalists, I mean, you know, saw themselves very in a very competitive sense, didn't they? I mean, you know, Lorraine, who was who's you know is one of the central characters in in your writing, mm. you know, was a very you know she was quite happy to play whatever game she needed to get the attention she needed from Absolutely. General MacArthur or whoever, you know, to get a seat on the plane and so on. Yep, uh, yeah. she was uh, quite ruthless mm. in her pursuit of a story, mm. I'd say, and her um, her daughter, who is also a journalist told me that her mother said to her, use what you've got. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I can't do that. Um, <laughs> I mean, there was nothing particularly untoward, yeah, yeah, yeah. but she was a very feminine, mm. very, very feminine-looking woman, you know, high heels, mm. lots of makeup, very feminine, but hard as nails underneath, mm. very mm. tough. And, um, and she was very determined to, um, to get where she wanted to go. So she, she really... She didn't stop asking the Australian military to let her go to mm. the front. Mm. She was constantly badgering them, mm. and they would turn her down with um, excuses that there were no facilities, which means no toilets for women. Mm. Mm. Um, but she just kept trying, and eventually it was General MacArthur who'd taken a shine to her, who said, you can go tomorrow, we're going to New Guinea, hop on the plane. Mm. And the Australians were... Absolutely furious, <laughs> absolutely, because they couldn't do anything about it because mm -hmm. General MacArthur was in charge. He was God. <laughs> yeah. But what they did do, because they were so angry about the fact that they couldn't keep women to the, uh, to the home front, because New Guinea was, a, was an operational area, was they immediately cancelled all the women's 
Um, there were 15, 16 women war correspondents in Australia at the time. They cancelled all of their licences after, after that because they couldn't control them. And did, was there any collective action by uh, that 16? I mean, did they try and find... No. No, there was nothing they could do. I mean, that, that not having a war correspondence licence meant you had no... Uh, you couldn't get access to any military units or access to transport, that sort of thing. So they didn't go to the Human Rights Commission <laughs> and <laughs> demand that they be given a chance to <laughs> exercise their craft. I mean, there, were, there were women who were in... So the women in Europe then at that time, so the, he cancelled the licences at the, the end of... Um, 43, but in 44, the women who were already living in London, there were a couple of Australian women working there, so they became war correspondents mm. over there. Mm. Mm. So it was dependent was where you were working and who you were accredited to mm. in terms of mm. what sort of access you could mm. get. Mm. Mm. But that sort of collective action, activity, I mean, Joy, in, in your sort of, your tale of the Greek, your Greek people, mm. your, in your family and, and beyond, mm. I mean, was that sort of sense of collective engagement something that was... Well, I mean, it, to it a must point, be very fraught it, because of the, you know, the, the I civil mean, war. And to a like point, um, for those who know about the civil war, I mean, any civil war divides yeah. the people, and um, I have to say, even to this day, it still divides people, mm. uh, and in Australia, it still mm. divides communities and families. Mm. So, in fact, it's a good case study mm. of uh, a war that left to take the title of the great collection, mm. enduring legacies mm. in more ways than one. It wasn't just psychological; mm. it was familial at the most brutal and sort of core level mm, mm. Um, of uh, alienation, um, you know, real uh, disagreements within families, splitting of families. So while there's a collective sense, there's not one narrative about mm. the war, about any war really. Mm. Um, I mean, the Second World War possibly because mm. um, the experience in Greece and the, you know, invasion by, by Germany. Um, but actually the Civil War has left the larger yes. scars. Yes. And I think there's something about a civil war that, mm. that does that. Mm. Mm. Um, and in fact, um, <laughs> just very recently, I was wanting to use some interview material uh, in, in my book and um, had to pull it because there are members of the family who disagree, not with me, but mm. with each other, mm. Um, mm. About, about the position of the family within that war. Mm. So mm. Um, it's a very live issue, mm. um, very live indeed. In fact, sometimes when I've given papers on that, topic of the impact of the Greek Civil War, some people get up in the audience, um, there may be someone today who'll do this, <laughs> and they say, um, you know, do you realise uh, if you gave, you could not give that paper in Greece mm. uh, today? Mm. Um, mm. And all I'm doing, what I can see, is opening up this question about mm. memory and war mm. and how we remember it. Mm. And I mean, there's a tendency to go back to Cold War polarities. Mm. Mm. Whereas I think in my work I've been trying to work away from that, get mm. away from that sort of Cold mm. War positioning mm. and um, look at the emotional mm. uh, traumas within mm. families mm. of how that's mm. played out. Mm. Um, so there's no unity in this story, uh, especially, I mean, as I was saying, around a civil war when it's, yes. it's by nature and by definition a divisive one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that's been very interesting um, in talking about the legacy of the First World War um, um, and David, you touched on this before when you were talking about your your ability to ex access those psychiatric archive records, the medical records. That that process of digitising the first the, the war records has been an enormous undertaking. I mean, it's been a you know it's been a really remarkable and impressive piece of, of sort of um, making family histories available in a way that is not available in other areas. You know, the fact that that it was a decision to, to digitise war records rather than migration records or Indigenous records or colonial records. You know, we'll put that to one side at the moment because it sort of skews the discussion. Um, but one of the things that was interesting, and it picks up on what Joy was saying, and was that um, I did a session at the National Library in Canberra and one of the panellists was Frank Bongiorno, who's a, a professor at ANU. And he was talking about his family's history of having come here post-war um, and how his uncle had been a fighter in the Italian army and how his terror during the war. And, and he went on to say, he said, oh, one of the things that happened that was interesting about the sort of legacy of the, I mean, about the way in which the public response to the commemoration was actually much more muted, I think, than, than had been anticipated. Was to, he said that part of it was that in a way that digitisation and the easy 
access to the records that were available from the First World War, basically meant that it was speaking to a portion of the population that could trace their presence in this country to 1914, essentially. So it, for, for everyone who's come sort of post Second World War, mm. there's no hook back into, into that experience. Mm. So I'm just sort of interested in how that sort of, how those sort of layers, you know, we sort of assume, you know, I'm sure that the media, for instance, assumed mm. that there would be a great upswelling of interest in, in the First World War story. The ratings on the television were abysmal. You know, the mm. the, the engagement mm. was actually quite slight mm. for the resources. You know, six hundred odd million dollars that were spent on it that was that were made available. Mm. So I'm sort of interested in. You know, there's a whole lot of complex stuff mm. in there, but I just, it it just seems to me that there's something going on. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure whether it's got something to do. I mean, with how it felt like those stories were being manufactured, as mm. it were, and somewhat homogenised or, mm. you know, in the, in the way that things were being mythologised. And I, I suppose we've been talking today, you know, that's why it's fascinating to hear about the women journalists mm. of the Second World War, because it's, it's a, quote, marginal story or, you know, a story of, from the margins thing you, that you don't hear about. And so it's, it's, it's much more interesting mm. f and, and, and rings true in a way that the, the, the kind of hyper-mythologised mm. Anzac story now I'm, you know, speaking personally, I mm. I turn off from it because mm. I I think it's it's beyond a Hollywood movie, as it were, mm. and and it no longer speaks to me with with the true mm. sense of a, of human feeling that we've been talking about. Mm. Yeah, I tend to agree. I mean, I I, I don't know I, I, about other people, but I f <laughs> the saturation coverage mm. had the effect, as you're saying, David. I think of feeling. I mean, for me anyway, there's nothing new being said. Mm. It's a one-note story, mm. and that's not to say it's not an important one or mm. one that you know we need to um, continue in our in our. It's a bit like this. It's a, sorry, it's a bit like this year with the um, the AFL football, where they've tried to re-engage fans by having all of these these things where each club would have kind of a, a different, um, you know, a, a, a different sort of pre-game. Mm. you know, thing or a song that they would all sing or some, something where they've kind of sat down with a marketing company and gone, mm. what, could re what can engage fans with this club? Mm. And you can see people kind of going, oh, you know, give me mm -hmm. a break. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I didn't think... Um, I mean, there are so many new angles still to tell mm -hmm. of the First World War. Mm -hmm. There are so many new takes on it, if you like, mm -hmm. but uh, the commercialisation of Anzac doesn't allow for it. Mm -hmm. And... I don't think it will actually for a while. Mm. I think that you know you have to wait until it's no longer a commercial commodity mm. for there to be new stories to emerge. Because I think at the moment there's no space. You know, it's a funny sort of combination. Because on the one hand it's commercial, and on the other it's it's taken a sort of quasi sacred sort of space. So you can't actually do something that's critical because that offends you know at some sort of well. Yeah, a couple of colleagues and myself um, were engaged in a book called What's Wrong with Anzac? Mm. And uh, some of the feedback we got on that was extraordinary. Mm. Um, yeah, because, I mean, we were just trying to say that, you know, Australia did not become a nation uh, on Anzac Day. It was a nation in, on 19, you know, in 1901. Um, Australian history did not start with Anzac Day. There's a, there's a great history before that, and so on and so forth. Uh, it ha has so overshadowed anything... Uh, to do with Australian history. Mm. So, you know, you either engage with it or you step back. Mm. And, and I guess, like I said, there are still so many interesting stories to tell about the, the First World War, not, not, not least of which is conscription, mm. Mm. Um, which next year will be its centenary. Mm. And it'll be interesting to see whether you get the same coverage. I doubt it, because that's a story about division and it's a, it's, it's a very heated... But it's, a, it's this also a story about courage, and it's also a story about um, mm -hmm. something which goes to a sort of an authenticity. I mean, you know, in terms of the sort of making the nation stuff, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the subscription debates, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, mm -hmm. that a country could vote, mm -hmm. could be asked to vote, and then could mm -hmm. vote twice against conscription. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, it's, it's a marker of a very sophisticated state that mm -hmm. that can occur, you know. It's um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, some people have been saying, oh, it would be interesting to see whether next year and, and as that, those... Those those days are they, that time is noted. Whether there will be people being asked to tell the story of their their descendant, you know, their forebears mm. who were involved in the in the conscription mm. debate, and whether that'll get the same sort of attention mm. as a sort of radical history in a way. Mm. Um, mm. 
Um, so. I mean, that will be interesting. Yeah. Um, it, it's such an extraordinary event in Australian mm. history, 20th mm. century Australian history. Mm. Um, and, you know, the, the scholarship on it um, is, 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 it's been dormant for a while, actually. And I was involved in a two-day conference not long ago mm. um, on looking at new perspectives on conscription. Uh, and again, there are so many new things to look into and layers. Um, it is a, a real moment in time for Australia. Mm. Uh, and and it, you know, I think I think it's uh, it, it. I think those events mark it as mm. a nation, mm. Mm. actually, um, mm. not mm. the defeat of Gallipoli. Mm. And and in a, gen, in a gendered sense, I mean, you know, the, it was women who were amongst mm. the the That's strongest right. leaders of that. You know, That's so right. maybe it plays to, the, to your point as well, Janine, about mm. the no, invisibility that, of that stuff. Yeah, I think what I would say about all this is that one encouraging thing I think that's been happening is is other stories from the margins mm. coming forward. Mm. So I feel similar to you guys that, I, that there's, we felt a bit barraged by <laughs> um, <laughs> Anzac stories, mm. World War One stories, especially Gallipoli related. Um, but at the same time, there's so much fabulous, fascinating scholarship going on around the country. Mm. For example, unearthing um, the stories of black diggers, which is incredible. Mm. But that's not what we're seeing mm. um, in the public mm. domain. Mm. So, ho unless you're you know, read, unless you're carefully reading Griffith's review, in which case, no. oh, of, <laughs> course, of course, of course, but, um, of course. but I look forward to those stories <laughs> yeah. coming to the fore. Yeah, I guess yeah, those, yeah. those more marginal stories. Yeah. 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 And that was fascinating in reading the this edition of the Griffith review. The I can't remember whose whose article it was, but about the the controversy with the war memorial and the recommendation mm. that they should include the frontier wars mm. and recognition mm, of, right. of those, but, and that mm. despite, mm. despite, I think, their own um, experts recommending mm. they should, that they still haven't yes. done that. Mm. Yes, Brendan Nelson piece. has just said he won't. He's no. ruled it out completely. Yeah. But, but the, other, the, other, the other story which is in there which touches on that is the, um, is the piece by Tim Rouse, which was about the process of in, Aboriginal people being moved out of remote Australia um, um, during the war, because you know, it's sort of the, the fear that if the Japanese mm. arrived, at one level, there's, he's got some quote from somebody who said that that the, they were fearful that if the Japanese arrived, that the Aboriginal people in Northern Australia would collaborate with the Japanese. <laughs> so it was, you know, it plays at all sorts of weird, weird levels. So, um, one of the things that um, is interesting in, in in all of your pieces, uh, well, maybe not Janine in yours, but but in, but in the others, is, is the is the way that you um, are able to draw on fiction that's been written about these experiences. That in a way, and David, I mean, you've obviously done a lot of memoir writing, which sort of you know gets to that sort of blurry edge between fiction and, and non-fiction. But I'm mean, just interested in. In, in why it might be that the straight reporting and the straight facts and the straight information that, that comes out of these areas doesn't actually take you there. I mean, Joy, you, you, you mm. cite a number of, of the novels. There's a great it. book, I recommend it, called Two Greeks, which is about the Cyprian, the Turkish invasion, invasion of Cyprus mm. um, and um, the survivors of that who um, grew up in Australia, the family's Australian. It's a terrific novel and it... it captures beautifully the, the, what we're talking about tonight, mm. the, the emotional legacy of war, the, uh, the silences, the masculinity, um, the, the, the difficulty of, of narrating stories in a new place, all those layers, and it's done beautifully in this fictionalised mm. account. Mm. Now, I think it just, I don't know, I'm not a fiction writer, but it, it allows a certain licence and freedom, I suppose, mm. to mm. talk about emotion, create characters that inter in, interact in a way um, and and to really bring these issues mm, home. Mm. Um, I think fiction can really do this beautifully, and that book is, is mm, one example. Mm. Yeah, I suppose I'm, I tend to use not fiction so much as a particular personal form of non-fiction, mm. which, on the one hand, what I really love is, is the particular nuances of people's voices. Mm. So the fact that uh, Nicola, the grandson of, of Giuseppe, had, had written in this project, he, he'd found his, his, Giuseppe's diaries from the war, and you could hear his voice mm -hmm. through those, a very specific um, language. And, and again, in the story of my father, when I found the, the medical records, that was the only place where I could hear his voice because some of the psychiatrists had written down things that he'd said, and I could hear that through, mm -hmm. through there. And so I think what can be powerful in, in transmitting these stories is being very small and precise, if you like, both with, with 
um, observing scenes, observing, you know, trying to describe like the scene when Sandra came to this farm for the first time and wandered around it and looking at the emotions on her face and then talking to her afterwards and trying to kind of just re report, if you like, but on, mm -hmm. on, the, on the kind of full panoply of, of the emotional um, the emotions within that and that, that, that f from those attention to details, if you like, which is something mm -hmm. that, that often fiction does as well, that, that you can bring out bigger themes sure. and bigger mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. sure. did, did any of your women write novels? I mean, Elizabeth Riddell obviously wrote poetry, but did there... Um, Janet Mitchell, who covered the um, Manchurian occupation, mm -hmm. Japanese occupation of Manchuria, she wrote a novel based on her experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to use in history, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, that's the only one I can think of. Mm. Yeah. But um, I'm interested in um, the experience on the home front, particularly in Melbourne during the Second World War and the interaction between um, the women particularly and, and the American GIs. And I was wondering if you were able to shed any light on that particular time and the interaction that um, the Australians and the Americans had with one another. Um, the only thing I can really say about it is that it was an extremely sensitive issue <laughs> um, in the newspapers, so um, it was censored. So I know that some of my women reporters um, wrote some stories, for example, about Australian women falling pregnant um, to American GIs and those, those stories didn't, didn't, get, didn't get published. So there was a lot of sensitivity about... Because even though there was no specific censorship regulation that applied, the, um, the censors could um, use their discretion if they thought that it would lower morale. If they thought the story would lower the morale of Australian servicemen, they could cut the story or recommend that it be cut. So anything about suggesting that they were falling pregnant or using contraception or that, that, that marriages Being raped. were... Yeah, yeah, or, mm -hmm. yeah, or ma that marriages were um, in danger. So there were also these kind of like agony aunt type columns where women write in and say, what should I do? I've fallen in love with an American. How do I tell my husband? <laughs> and that came to the attention of the censor who said, we can't include this because it will lower morale. So. I, I, I commend the, um, the new, the most recent Peter Carey book, uh, is The Legal Self. He, has a, he writes very, very well about that relation between, between American and Australian soldiers in Brisbane um, during that period. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I've read a fair bit of the sort of record of that, and I think that what Carey does in, in that novel is, is capture that quite, quite brilliantly. Um, it, it's, it's really just a comment, I guess. Um, I'm a child of a Holocaust survivor who's now died and mother who left Germany, Berlin in 1937. And um, I'd been living in Sydney. I've returned to Melbourne last year and I'm finding myself writing more and writing probably with humour, poetic, abstract. I, I'm also being a painter. And I guess mainly it's, it's probably because I couldn't in a way, since my father was alive, really look at the Holocaust and look at things. And, and it, maybe it's a, I'm trying to dialogue with my father now. And in, in another way, I think um, I'm reading out my work to my mother and it has a humour and she has, you know, she's understanding it. And yeah, like, so for me, it's almost like I'm, I'm being driven in some way, even though I've been, you know, fighting against it because I love being a visual artist. But I find writing in some ways is, is a much, even though you're talking about the smallness of writing, it doesn't have to be commercial or large. There is something about my mother's 89, she'll hopefully be 90 in a month, that how can I communicate to her and also understand her past before her memory goes and I'm not able to listen anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, go on. Oh, I think that, <clears throat> that makes me think of... Um, there's a um, concept called post-memory which, which describes the, the way that memories of, of traumatic events are passed on and, and, and um, live on in the second generation. That, that, 
something that was brought to mind when you were talking there. And also I think it's interesting that we often have a sense that if things aren't spoken about, then they aren't transmitted. But actually, so much is transmitted from generation to generation without being spoken about, you know, just through the, the, the moods in the, in the house or the objects or all those sorts of things. And, and mm -hmm. those are things which I think you can draw upon in, mm -hmm. in, in writing about your parents' experiences and how that's, how that's fed through into your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, thank you very much. It's a very powerful, um, you know, story you've shared with us. Um, I wondered about timing, you know, it's, and I'm interested that you're saying you're doing this now, um, and timing's really important. You have to be, your parents have to be, your family has to be kind of ready to take that leap into narrative or discourse or something, visual um, expression, and maybe it takes a whole kind of the next generation to do that. Um, and often it is elderly parents, and um, I, was, I was interested that your mother's elderly, and yeah, there is that question about the timing and, and the urgency, perhaps, of, of now. Um, but, you know, in the book I've just completed, a, a third of the people I interviewed have now passed away. Mm. Um, there is an urgency about these issues, I think, mm. and it's really important to get it down and, mm. um, you know, for, for the record. And I guess for your own personal journey, but for, but for the historic record yeah. as well. One, one of the pieces in the in the volume um, by Tim Bonnie Hady talks about integrating the, the his yeah. sort of family yeah. story in that mm. way, and, mm. and and it was about sort of finding himself back in in Vienna on the anniversary of 75th anniversary of Kristallnacht yeah. um, when his family had been taken away, and and then going through the sort of process of trying to sort of integrate bits that, had, that hadn't quite made mm. sense to him. Mm. And one of them was a trip that he did with his mother in, I think, 1971. His mother took them back to Germany and they went to Dachau. And at that point, and they spent several days there, and it was sort of like, you know, it was sort of like a weird thing to do in a way. Mm. But at the time, he didn't know that that's where his grandfather had been um, for, that, for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And and it was sort of like this interesting sort of process of how, you know, as he said, he f things which became invisible suddenly made sense. When he was there, he was sitting in this mm -hmm. cafe in Vienna mm -hmm. on the anniversary and thinking, yeah. oh, I understand why, you know, the fact that he was his head was bald, you know, why how that played out in this family story over a long period of time. So um, I just mention that because I think you might find it sort of mm -hmm. quite quite a, you know, an interesting thing to read and maybe has resonances that would be appropriate. Mm. Thank you all so very much. It's been great. I hope you've found it interesting. I hope you enjoy the collection. It's, it's, I think it is, I mean, I'm happy, I, I am able to say this, having edited 48 of them, it's one of the best. So if you haven't read it before, read Griffith's Review before, start with this one. Um, and um, I look forward to seeing you maybe again at another event here. Thank you. Yeah.